Thank you, Mike. Um, welcome everybody to a joint committee hearing with General Housing and Military Affairs from the House of Representatives at the Vermont State House and the Senate Government Operations Committee. Um, we are here today uh, together as a group to hear from the National Guard and from some ad advocates on the issue of what is the role of the National Guard, the Vermont National Guard, uh, and the interplay with federal federalization when it comes to incidents on domestic soil. And this came up as a, as a conversation piece um, and a desire to um, hear from the Guard as um, in response to some of the incidents that have been happening in the Northwest in Portland, Oregon, to be precise, where we have seen um, public dissent being being handled in a, in a way that perhaps is not what we would like to see and certainly won't, don't want to see from our guard folks. So I wanted to start off today by um, welcoming Senator White um, and her committee to the to the to this hearing. Senator. Thank you and thank you for having us. I think this is um, a much better use of time and resources to have us all meet together rather than to have us ask the guard and the witnesses to <laughs> come and testify before both of us and say the same thing. So thank you very much for setting this up. Sure. And with that, I'm gonna let you um, <clears throat> take it away and do, because I'm used to moderating, moderating or facilitating a much smaller group of people. We only have five people. And so I'm not used to doing all these people. And just so that uh, people know I have to leave at four o'clock. I don't want anybody to be offended if I leave, but I'm meeting with a very unhappy constituent and the agency of transportation who's coming down today to meet with him. So I will be leaving at four. Thank you. Great, thank you. And so um, General, um, General Knight, I see that, that you have a, a crew of people with you. I think, the way that I would like to um, see today's meeting go is general, if you could introduce folks with you today, um, I see in a separate box, we have uh, Colonel Roberts, um, but if you could introduce the folks that are with us today, and then um, what I would like to be able to do is let you make your main statements and, and conversation. Um, we may have questions, uh, and committees and just maybe not have it so that it's so that we interrupt the general um, throughout the time that we're here but just maybe let's um, but before we get to the next witnesses maybe we can have a Q&A after that um, and then we'll move to um, Mr. Stanek and then Mr. Zaplinski and um, we will wrap up we are we have the we have the zoom until 4 30 so um, with that uh, General Knight and company welcome Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, welcome, Senators, Representatives, Mr. Stanek, Mr. Splitsky. So with me today, I've got uh, Mr. Ken Gregg, who's our Deputy Adjutant General, Colonel Justin Davis, who's our State Operations Officer. We've got uh, Major Kurt Kaplan, who's our Judge Advocate General, uh, Director of my Joint Staff, Brigadier General Dave Manfredi, um, Colonel Randy Gates, who's our Director of Military Support, and uh, Larry Doan, he's probably off the camera. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Doan is the executive officer. So I've asked these folks to be here because I know a little about a lot. Uh, there may be some questions that, that come that I don't have a, an answer that would be perhaps in, in great enough specificity. So I've asked for some subject matter expertise to be here. Um, central to that obviously is Colonel Gates, um, especially when I look at uh, how the guards being used um, with COVID response, he is integrated with the Department of Emergency Management and the state EOC and uh, speaks with uh, Director Borderman probably on a daily basis of coordinating response there. So uh, any questions before I jump into how we're used? So it's probably important to know how we're built. So as a guard, the 54 states and territories uh, all of us work for our respective governors. And normally, if we were to be called initially, that would be under state active duty. And we do our during weekends, we do our annual training, and that's under Title 32. If federalized, if mobilized, uh, for instance, to deploy, 
uh, in support of combatant commanders, we would go under Title 10 of U.S. Code. So uh, it's important to remember we have to support a dual mission. First and foremost is response to the governor and to the citizens of Vermont. And then when mobilized by the National Command Authority, uh, we prepare for our federal missions. And that's where the vast majority of our funding originates. Uh, so as an example, um, our guard, even as a small state, just for our pain allowances, uh, we bring in about uh, pretty close to $130 million of federal payroll uh, every year in the form of drill, uh, annual training. And of course, we've got a pretty robust uh, full-time population uh, with federal technicians, active guard and reserve, and civilian uh, technicians, Title V. Uh, those are civilian technicians that they work for the guard, they are not in uniform. So uh, as far as how we are mobilized, um, that falls under Title 20 of Vermont Statutes Annotated, Section 601, 606, and 641. And I won't get into the specifics of it. Um, you can certainly look that up. Um, but it's we work for the governor, uh, first and foremost. Um, even if we were to be called up by the governor, uh, we will always be in a support role. Um, that's what the National Guard does. We are not the on-scene commander. If it's a fire chief, if it's a police chief, um, you know, if I look at our civil support team, uh, as, a, uh, as a, for instance, if they respond to unexploded ordinance, a bomb threat, um, or as they did a couple of years ago uh, for the person that was manufacturing ricin, you know, a biological agent, they are still under the supervision and authority of civil, uh, the civil officer in charge, whoever's in charge of the on-scene um, activity. And that doesn't change. So if we were to look at, uh, for us, if, uh, our role when it comes to civil disturbances, I think that's probably where a lot of the discussion is going to go. I, I see it as very straightforward. Our role, our supporting role um, of civil authority is to preserve life, protect property, and maintain public safety. Um, that's it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, that's our job. It is always in the background. It is always in support. Any follow-ups to that, Mr. Chair? Well, I think um, if you want to um, move it, you know, move the conversation to one of your folks who can talk in more detail just about, um, I mean, let's create this, let's create the scenario of, of what we're talking about here. You know, we're talking about a situation where um, we saw armed individuals with a uniform on uh, really take to the streets to, um, to quelch uh, a protest. Um, and I think the, cons the question here, I don't know if it's a concern, but I, I mean, of course it's a concern, that's why we're here. But, but the question is, under what circumstances would the guard be called up for something like this? And we can then talk about whether it's likely or whether it's possible or how, how it would work through the system. Um, that talks about what what happens here. I mean, we can go way back in time, and and we know um, the incident at Kent State stands out as as a as a poor example of guard response to um, uh, to a to a protest. Um, that clearly hasn't happened like that for a long time, not with the guard, but can you just discuss like, so here's a situation where the Department of Homeland Security has a crew of people. Are you, or, you know, are you in the same circumstance? Can the president federalize us, federalize the guard in a way that, that would, that would have that happen? So I'll answer part of it and I'll, I'll probably defer to Colonel Gates. There's a, a very rigorous process that goes into requesting guard support through the state EOC, and then Major Kaplan will talk a little bit about um, actually federalizing troops because that changes the dynamic altogether. Um, for us, again, it would work through the process. The governor would authorize uh, through the Department of Public Safety, for instance, if there were not a protest, but a riot. Um, we would, the, the support would come. We have a quick response force that's available uh, within four hours. Um, how many workers is that? Um, 125. We have 125 soldiers and airmen available uh, within four hours. So that would be in case of riot. 
Um, I view this to give you a nice perspective. We are the resource of last resort. So if we're called, it is not protest. It is to me it's something vastly different. Um, even then, it is all very situational. And we are again taking our direction from an on scene civil authority. Um, and that would be in our case in, in Vermont, that will be under state active duty. And that's it's funded by the state of Vermont under the authority of the governor or the on scene commander requesting the assistance. So, Kurt, would you mind talking a little bit about um, Title 10, where we can be federalized and what that does for the chain of command? Certainly, sir. And all members of the uh, the National Guard are, are duly sworn as, off as officers or enlisted uh, in the state military force. Also, they are reserves of the Army or Air Force. And so in their status as reserves of the Army or Air Force, they can be federalized by the, the federal government because they are an uh, operational reserve for the federal government. If, they, if the federal government does do so uh, pursuant to uh, various federal authorities for mobilization, for <coughs> contingency operations, for uh, insurrection. If they do, if the federal government does do that, then they go into what uh, General Knight had already referred to as a Title 10 status. At that point in time, they are not functioning within the chain of command of the Vermont National Guard. They are actually uh, activated reserves of the federal military, and then they would be answering to their federal uh, chain of command at, at that point. Do you want to talk a little bit about the process for your request for support? Yes, sir. So, um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Colonel Randy Gates. I'm the Director of Military Support, but what that really means is I'm Chief Liaison to the Department of Public Safety for the Adjutant General. And I work closely with the uh, Vermont Intelligence Center, as well as a leadership within the Vermont State Police. So, we would get a, we would all concur that something is arising in Vermont that would require the Vermont National Guard to start planning for the eventual call-up of our soldiers and airmen. Um, it's important to uh, remember that our security capability lies both in the Air National Guard and in the Army National Guard. And we have plans that are in, in place that, that we've developed over time that we would decide, um, we, we would advise the governor as to whether or not we would have to, you know, bring people on to to, to augment uh, state police or local law enforcement. Um, one of the things I think that's important also to remember is we would, people would know that we are the National Guard. I mean, we our neighbors know that we're in the National Guard and they would see the National Guard. A lot of that's being confused um, in a lot of people's minds when they see all, the, all these uniformed people. Portland, for example, it wasn't the National Guard, it was federal troops, but because there's such a wide array of you know, uniform looking things that we have and different patches and things like that. We, if we were out there in the community, people would know that it's the Vermont National Guard protecting them. Um, so I, I, want, I think that that was important to, to point out as well. And when, when you say, when you say, um, actually, I have a question from, Representative Triano and then Senator Polina. Thank you. Um, so uh, that was one of my questions, Colonel. It seems to be that a lot of the um, confusion, consternation uh, surrounding the issues in Portland or the situation in Portland was that those troops were not, that individuals and organizations were not able to identify those troops um, and who they were and exactly what their mission was. So you did just clarify that for us. And I think that that's an important piece uh, that um, uh, Vermonters would know and recognize that um, the uh, individuals or the troops that were deployed would be our National Guard. Um, my, one of my other questions was, would it not be the uh, governor that would be able to enact um, the National Guard, um, if there was a situation in the state that uh, warranted um, some sort of uh, uh, police action or intervention in that respect, uh, prior to any federal uh, uh, um, deployment? 
Yes, the governor would have to make that decision as to whether or not he would bring us on. I mean, that's every dollar that goes to pay a soldier comes out of the state treasury, and he would have to make that decision as to bringing up um, perhaps as a preemptive um, um, action um, and station some of our troops or airmen at their at their at their armories. That decision would have to be made, and I'm sure he'd be taking the advice of you know all of his agency heads like Department of Public Safety and of course the Adjutant General. But that that would that's clearly a decision that the governor would make, yes. So my last question would be um, is the is the Vermont National Guard doing riot training? Um, I was deployed as a regular army troop uh, to the Resurrection City riots in the spring of 1968. And we had been training actually uh, for riot control uh, prior to that. And, you know, when we uh, rode into the Washington DC on armored personnel carriers with live ammo, you know, we kind of knew what, well, we, we did know what we were doing and what we would be facing. But uh, so does it then the Vermont National Guard do any riot training? Yes, we do. Um, and we actually just uh, redid our um, civil disturbance training manual here in the Vermont Guard back in July. We have both um, trained expertise within our ranks and then we have expertise that comes into the ranks from outside jobs. We have a large number of law enforcement um, expertise that, that are soldiers on the weekend, but county sheriffs and deputies and town police and then things like that. Um, most of our capability is on the air guard side. We have a large security force that guards the base anyway over there in South Burlington. And they, um, within our hierarchy, we've tasked them with being the lead for civil disturbance, hence they would have more training. And then our other large commands um, sort of would augment that, but also do, do some training. We really ask for a minimum of four hours a year training. That's mostly how to move formations. And recently we actually had six soldiers from one of our major commands take part in civil disturbance training at the Vermont Police Academy. This was about a month and a half ago. So yes, short answer, yes, we, we do do training. And lastly, uh, it's impressive to see a table full of brass such as this uh, sitting around in our committee. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, sir. So Mr. Chair, I just got a quick point of uh, a clarification when it comes to our role and, and responsibilities and actually our authorities. I've asked Major Kaplan to speak a little bit about what it is we can do when it comes to um, responding to civil disturbance. Um, can you talk about a little, little bit of that, Kurt? Thank you very much, sir. So there is uh, authorities to be called out in cases of riot. Uh, however, the Vermont National Guard has no law enforcement authority. They don't have any arrest powers, anything like that. That's a power that would be granted by the legislature. And in various states, some states, uh, there, that power exists. Vermont, that power does not exist. So the Vermont National Guard did not have the powers of, of police. Uh, as General Knight already said, they would be in an assist role uh, to quote riot if called out by the governor however they would not be a, a policing agency they wouldn't be uh, charging anyone they wouldn't be detaining anyone uh, unless they were specifically uh, directed or requested in assistance of a civil authority okay thank you represent uh, senator polina thank you <clears throat> thank you and thank you folks for being here my question actually is partially answered a couple of minutes ago i think my, it's my, what I wanted to do is be clear that it's the governor who is our, essentially our commander in chief of the National Guard. We talk about, we hear about federalization of the Guard. And I want to be clear, uh, it's sort of a question, I guess, although I think I know the answer now that while we might hear about federalization of the Guard, the Guard can't be called out unless the governor approves the, calls the Guard out. So it's up to the governor to make that decision. And I thought I understood that the governor's decision would have to be made with the consent of the Senate. So I just want to make sure if we're on the same page, if that's your understanding as well, that it is up to the governor, not the president, for example, to federal law to call out the troops and that the governor would need the consent of the Senate to do so. This is, this is Major Kaplan. Uh, because they're the National Guard, the federally funded National Guard is a reserve of the Army and Air Force, they can be federalized uh, for, uh, by the, the federal government. Uh, they can be called out and under, depending on the authority, there's various federal authorities for doing that. Some of them require the consent of the governor, some of them do not. Uh, and that's, that's established in the, in the federal statutes in Title 10, as well as uh, 
prior decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. Thanks. So can you list that off? I mean, I, you know, the question about, you know, the use of if, if, if the president, you know, tries to um, use the Insurrection Act, which was talked about this past summer, um, how does that work with how does that work with interplay between the governors, the, the president saying, I feel that there is something at risk. I feel that the government is at risk, that there's some form of, um, that there's a risk that's greater than, than normal. Um, and, I'm, and I'm kind of soft playing what the Insurrection Act would be used for. Um, but, but what are some, if it's not that, then what are some of the other things that, that, that overrule the governor, um, the governor's power to call up? What would the, what would the president or the federal government have um, the right to federalize you on domestic soil for? Uh, on domestic soil, it would primarily be Insurrection Act. Uh, on foreign, uh, unless there was a full scale invasion, then a full mobilization of the, the National Guard uh, by, a, by Act of Congress. Uh, and then there's, there's partial mobilizations under uh, emergency declarations. For example, our current uh, operations, as you're probably aware, there's not a act of Congress or a declaration of war, uh, but we've been operating under the emergency declaration that was made by uh, President Bush in 2001, and it's been continuing on and accepted by, uh, by his, his successor, uh, President Obama, and then President Trump. I've still been using that same emergency declaration for the, the continued uh, international operations. And that's a, a method that they can use for mobilization. There's limits to that on the number of overall soldiers. There's a limit to the number that they, uh, the length of time they can mobilize those soldiers, uh, but they can mobilize it without, uh, without uh, consent of the government. And with the people who mobilize, you're talking about 125 people um, are sort of on call for something like this. For monitors, this part are they folks? I mean, we know that the guard has people who are. We missed the beginning of that, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got everybody seems to be having a little bit of a um, connection problem. The question I had is, uh, it seems that you have a force. I'm going to turn my camera off here. Um, it seems that you have a force of 125 people who may be ready at any time to respond to um, something within the state if called up by the governor. Did I hear that correctly? We, Mr. Cohen Gates again. So we have these, these entities called um, National Guard Reaction Forces, and those um, can number up to 250. And then within those organizations, we've allowed the commanders to identify separate quick reaction forces. I actually gave the Adjutant General a bad number a minute ago. That's about a 50 person um, um, element, if you will. So within those response forces, there is a force that would arrive sooner uh, within four hours and be ready to be mobilized to wherever they're asked to go by the governor. Um, but they, they, are, they are identified uh, within our commands as being the ones that, that before anybody else, they would have the expectation of arriving first and being prepared uh, to to move to wherever the governor feels is necessary. And is there ever a circumstance where if a guard member is um, say on the streets of of any of our towns um, in as this as this kind of force where they are unidentified individually, like we saw in Portland with the DHS? No, they would be identified for the uniform and our uniform either on the air side or the army side says Air Force or Army and it has their last name. And they would have distinctive uh, perhaps uh, unit patches. Uh, when you're in the guard, you kind of know what patches belong to which command, um, but they would be identified. There would not be, um, there would not be any attempt to hide their, their name. There wouldn't be any attempt to hide, hide them behind uh, dark visors and helmets and things like that. People, people would recognize them. We're of the community and uh, they, they would see that. 
Okay, more questions for the guard at this time? I mean, I think we're just getting a real overview here of, of, of how they view this. I, I hesitate. No, I'm not gonna hesitate to ask. Um, it, do you have someone there who can really give us a quick thumbnail sketch of the Insurrection Act and what it means? I mean, the, the, if, if I didn't know better, I'd say, oh, is this posse comitatus? Is this, I mean, the Insurrection Act, I believe is from the early 19th century. Um, do you have a historian who can, who can tell us exactly what the Insurrection Act is and, and, and how it gets called up? Well, Mr. Chair, well, this is General Knight. While I am a historian, I am not an attorney, so I will turn that over to Major Caverly. <laughs> Certainly, that's a the Insurrection Act. It, it dates, you know, it dates way back. Uh, you can talk whiskey rebellion, you can talk uh, whatever you want, but the in its basic uh, legal uh, structure, it's a determination by the Chief Executive of the United States. That, uh, that an insurrection had occurred, and that would be some sort of larger action against the government. It's not defined in the statute. It's been defined various ways by the, the courts over the years as to what an insurrection is. But the deference of that is primarily given to the, the president as the chief executive, uh, as far as when an insurrection has occurred. It also is for uh, enforcing the uh, the orders of the, of the United States. So the uh, historically, the last time the Insurrection Act was used was the 1960s during uh, the Civil Rights Movement. And when I say during the Civil Rights Movement, it was on behalf of executing the orders of the U.S. Supreme Court. So primarily dealing with integration in the public schools, uh, integration at uh, colleges. So they were uh, there uh, assisting in uh, ensuring that the uh, uh, racial integration of of both secondary schools and uh, public institutions was conducted peacefully. So that, that was the last time was the 1960s that the Insurrection Act was, was utilized. Any further questions for the guard right now? Good. Senator Clarkson. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I guess, um, uh, General Knight, one of you, well, one of you used the word riot, um, which I find, you know, is, is that defined somewhere? Uh, you said that 125 were available in four hours in case of a riot. Um, and obviously at the direction of the governor. Is, is, is riot defined? And it, if not, um, is it a subjective term? I mean, how how's it defined, and and, and what are what 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 would trigger it? I guess those are my questions. Yes, ma'am. So a riot would be an example, um, but that QRF exists to support in any civic emergency, whether it's a flood, a fire, um, you know, whatever the governor or on scene commander requests. Uh, we would do a quick mission analysis and assign that mission to that quick reaction force. But as to the determination of when a riot is, is yeah. a riot, that's not something we do. That's something that the on-scene commander, a law enforcement official uh, would make that determination. You know, is there a definition? There, there's, not a, there's not a statutory definition uh, in Title right. 20, uh, but it, the determination uh, would be made uh, by, the, by the one calling them out, and that would be uh, the executive, the governor. So there's no statutory definition of a riot. Not that I'm aware of in Title 20 anyway. There may be in, in say, Title 13 for purposes of criminal, criminal. Yeah, okay, thank you. Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Jer. Um, I just wanna make sure I understood or, or um, that if you're called to help with these things, the guard cannot arrest people or take people and put them in vans and bring them to jail. Is that correct? Or if the police department asks you to do that, can you then do that? I think we can transport them, sir. Once they're placed under arrest, we provide people yeah. to transport. We would have to do a little digging on that, sir. Um, we do not make the arrest. We may be asked in support to conduct a transport of somebody. We're not the person affecting an arrest. 
So does that, uh, just so I understand, so that means you couldn't pick people up off the street and move them into a van, but you could drive them? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, that, thank you. Okay, further questions? All right, I wanna take the opportunity to turn to um, Ed Stanek. Um, Ed, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us, you know, how you're how you're interested in this in this issue, and you provided testimony with us that is posted. Um, the link is posted in our chat box. It is also on our website for today's hearing. Um, so, uh, if you can unmute yourself, it's easier on your end than it is on mine. Um, uh, welcome to welcome to General Housing and Military Affairs and Senate Government Ops. Uh, thank you, Chairman Stevens. I hope have, am I muted still? No, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. My name is Ed Stanick. I'm a resident of Barry City. Um, over many years, I had cause to uh, perform uh, legal research on both the constitutional bases and uh, federal and state legislation relative to the role of the National Guard. I thank the committees for this opportunity to provide you with my perspective uh, on these issues. Um, the reason I have concerns are the comments made by President Donald J. Trump on the public record over the last several months, uh, intimating uh, that there are certain circumstances under which uh, he would intend to federalize and to use the National Guard uh, as he has indicated. I wanted to indicate early on that I am not anti-National Guard and I am certainly not anti-law enforcement. Uh, in another capacity, uh, I served as the past president of the Vermont State Employees Association and our members included many members of the National Guard, full-time employees, as well as law enforcement officers. So I have no bias here against the Guard and the law enforcement officers. I respect the work they do for the community. And I also wanted to note that my brother's a retired law enforcement officer in an urban area who spent a lot of time at Ground Zero after 9-11. Uh, as the chair indicated, I pre-filed seven pages of testimony and I'm certainly not gonna read all my testimony to you. I just wanted to uh, uh, comment on some highlights of my testimony. Uh, my purpose of, the purpose of my testimony is threefold. Number one, to assist the committees with a perspective on the erosion of state authority over the Vermont National Guard by the Vermont, by the federal government, perhaps in disregard of constitutional restrictions. Number two, to articulate concerns for the potential use of the Vermont National Guard to suppress rights of assembly and free speech, which are protected under the Vermont Constitution, chapter one. And number three, to urge the committees to deliberate on actions that the General Assembly may take in collaboration with the governor to forestall suppression of the fundamental democratic right of dissent through the possible illicit use of the Vermont National Guard by the executive branch of the federal government during the period specifically between November 4th, 2020 and January 20th, 2021. And as I said, I'm not gonna read my pre-filed testimony, but some highlights on pages one and two of the, uh, the pre-file, I provide the Reader's Digest historical overview of how laws have evolved in this country regarding the use of the National Guard, which we, in other contexts, recognize as the militia. And if you get an opportunity to read my testimony, which I hope you do, you will see how there was this erosion that took place uh, as to who controls the militia. Uh, there are some references which I excerpted in my testimony to the specific provisions of both the federal and the state constitution. And I encourage you to read those provisions side by side to see exactly, so to speak, who's on first and who's on second in terms of what they can do. This dates back to the original documents in the constitutions. But after the constitutions were ratified, Congress was empowered to enact laws as to how the militia would actually be implemented. And again, to make a long story short, you will read um, that mu not much happened uh, on the congressional front during the 1800s, but beginning in the 1900s and running from around 1902 through 1986, you can see in the references to the enactments how 
the powers of the governors were curtailed and cut back. Uh, I respectfully disagree with the perspective offered by the members of the National Guard as to exactly what powers remain for the governor of Vermont. It's really not that simple. I mentioned in my testimony that I did not include references to case law. Uh, there isn't that much case law, surprisingly, in either federal district courts, the circuit courts, or the Supreme Court. But on page two of my submittal, I mentioned a US Supreme Court decision, uh, US v. Miller, decided in the 1930s. And it's interesting in a sense that it refers to the Second Amendment, which most of us think of in terms of gun rights, so to speak but the Second Amendment has a role in terms of militia. And it's a very interesting Supreme Court decision that talks about the roots of the militia, now known as the National Guard, how it should be firmly anchored in the communities from which those Guard members come. Page three of the testimony are those excerpts from the constitutions. Pages four and five, actually pages four, five, and six, I provide you with excerpts from the actual federal statutes and the state statutes with regard to the guard. I provide you with the actual language of the oaths, the oaths that are taken by the members of the guard and the oaths that are taken by the officers of the guard. Uh, and I urge you to read that language carefully. The phrase or the term commander in chief is used in many different fashions in both the constitutional and in the statutory provisions. And I mention that at this juncture because you know, it, it ties in again with that oath that they take. To who is the fidelity owed in the final analysis, I guess is the bottom line. On page five, uh, I provide you verbatim with the actual language by which the President of the United States can call the National Guard into federal service. Um, excuse me. On page six of my testimony, I took excerpts from the Vermont National Guard website, wherein they state their mission statement, and they provide us with facts about the strength of the National Guard. Um, the National Guard certainly knows this better than I do, but approximately 3,700 people belong to the National Guard, which is a combination of what they call, quote unquote, traditional guardsmen and women, and then they have 1,121 full-time employees. You might have noticed the recent media reports a couple of months ago about how the Pentagon is calling into active service approximately 1,000 members of the Vermont National Guard uh, at a level which they said has not been seen in the last 10 years. And starting in a few weeks, running through 2021, approximately 1,000 members of the Vermont National Guard will not be in Vermont. That begs the question about what happens if the president decides to call out the National Guard when the Vermont National Guard isn't here or their forces depleted. Uh, I will just mention the fact that we all saw uh, in the news what happened, I believe it was in Wisconsin, when the president moved to bring in National Guard troops from other states. He brought in troops from three other states uh, to interact with the citizens of Wisconsin. On page six of my submittal, I discuss what I call a dilemma. I'll just read you a, a paragraph or two. Over the last several months, President Donald J. Trump has made numerous public statements suggesting that he may utilize military forces as well as other federal agents within the United States to address what he sees as quote unquote, anarchy, treason and insurrection. The president has asserted that he believes he has unconstrained powers to do that. The apparent criteria based on his own comments to make such action or take such action includes threats to federal property and civil unrest in cities which have democratic mayors. That's what the president has said of the criteria. I asked that I be allowed to stipulate to the committees that my summary, uh, summary of his testimony, of his representations are accurate, but if necessary, I will supplement my testimony with actual documentation of what he said as the basis for calling out uh, National Guards. In addition to an array of other powers granted to the president, some of which I summarize in my submittal, there's 136 other quote unquote emergency action authorizations throughout the United States code that the president can take 
as he sees fit. In addition to that, the Brennan Center for Justice has identified approximately 50 presidential emergency action documents, which no one has really seen. Even Congress hasn't seen these. And again, I won't go into great detail, but in my testimony, I provide you with a link to the Brennan Center so you can read about these 50 unseen presidential emergency action documents by which he can act. Vermonters have assembled over the centuries to speak out on the vast range of issues. Oftentimes they have assembled at federal properties, such as the federal buildings that house the judiciary and other agencies across the Green Mountains. It is reasonable to assume that they may do so in coming months, should there be disputes associated with the tabulation and the results of the national election for president. Vermonters are not sheepish about standing up for their rights. So what are my conclusions? What can be expected should the Vermont National Guard be activated under such circumstances as President Trump has threatened? What actions might be taken by the General Assembly in collaboration with the governor to forestall a confrontation between Vermonters? The Guard acting at the behest of the president to suppress rights extended to other Vermonters under chapter one of the Vermont Constitution. To whom will the officers and the members of the Vermont National Guard owe their fidelity under their oaths? Perhaps committee members will be able to discern a tangible basis for an optimistic outcome under the circumstances I outlined above, but I am less than optimistic due to usurpation of federal authority over the Vermont militia, the Vermont National Guard. It appears, based upon the legal authorities I provided your committees with, it appears that the last remaining substantive power of a state governor over the militia, despite what the guard just told you, the last remaining substantive power of a state governor over the militia is the ability to call out the guard during a quote unquote state emergency. We now face a situation where an American president in his capacity as commander in chief may be able to turn Vermonter against Vermonter should he attempt what was once unthinkable in his quest to retain political power. Will history then reflect that the Vermont National Guard, quote unquote, only followed orders as the torch of democracy was extinguished? So that's the highlights of my testimony. Uh, there are lots of legal authorities referenced in what I filed with the committees. Uh, including uh, two very well done law reviews, uh, which I encourage you or your legal staff to take a look at. They really drill down into what happened during the 20th century in terms of peeling back the powers of the governor. Uh, and I encourage you to look at that because that's the lens through which I'm sure the president and his staff are looking at things these days. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, any questions for Ed right now? Representative Hengo. Thank you. Um, my question is for Mr. Stanek, what, um, what capacity are you speaking to us in today? I see that you're listed on our witness list as a concerned Barry City, Barry City citizen. Do you have a legal background? Are you representing any particular organizations in your testimony today? I'm here today strictly as a retired guy who lives in Barry City. Uh, I'm not an attorney. I participated in the Supreme Court's four-year clerkship program. When it came time to, time to take the bar, we found out we were going to have twins. I needed health insurance. I got a job at the state. I stayed there for 32 years. My specific experience in doing research about the background of the National Guard is twofold. Number one, uh, in the 1980s, the issue arose about the increased use of the Underhill firing range uh, and the firing of the use of depleted uranium shells at the Underhill firing range. And a committee was formed by the towns of Jericho and Underhill and I volunteered to help them. I used to teach legal research and writing. Uh, one of my students was the former Justice Marilyn Skolgan of the Vermont Supreme Court. Another one of my students was Amy Davenport, the former now retired chief administrative judge of the Superior Court. 
and another student, not, not tooting my horn here, just explaining my background. And another former student of mine was Robert Appel, who became the Defender General for the state of Vermont. I also used my legal research and writing skills um, a few years ago when the question arose about the F-35s uh, and their mission in Vermont. And again, I did uh, research to assist the legal team in that as it wound its way through the Vermont uh, uh, court system up through the Vermont Supreme Court. So in a long-winded way, Representative, I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. I appreciate knowing a little bit more about you since I'm unfamiliar with your work. Um, I do have a question though. Um, it, it's apparent that you don't feel that the president has the ability to call up the federal reservists who are um, on reserve from the army and the air force. So if we did have what is being called a riot in Vermont, um, who do you suggest would be best suited to deal with helping our local law enforcement on that, in that circumstance? Oh, it's quite the opposite representative. I believe the president of the United States has essentially carte blanche to federalize and to call up the use of each state's national guard in isolation. There's really no constraints any longer over the president. That's my bottom line. Certainly the governor has remaining powers, but they do fit into a legal thimble, the powers of the governor. State emergencies, when we had the hurricane, uh, the National Guard's called out, so on and so forth. But as far as dealing with what we would call civil unrest, uh, it really is carte blanche for the president of the United States. So he or she can call out National Guards at the drop of a hat. Thank you. I guess I was getting a, a little bit different tone from your testimony, but thank you. I appreciate that. Senator White. So given this, you, you said that you had some recommendations for um, legislative action that could be taken that you thought would, would curtail some of that um, carte blanche authority and bring it back under the control of the governor and the civil authority in Vermont. Did you have, I had not had a chance yet to read your um, report. Did you have recommendations in there for legislative action that could be taken? There is no specific recommendation in my submittal because uh, I really could not come up with a definitive basis in law. But having said that, there is that provision where the governor may act regarding a quote unquote state emergency. My personal feeling is based upon the statements we're hearing from the president, which are only going to increase as the, as the coming weeks go on, I think there might be grounds somewhere around November 3rd uh, for the governor to declare a state emergency in a, uh, a preventative way. Uh, if we have the President of the United States saying that the election doesn't count, we can anticipate that Vermonters will want to exercise under chapter one of our constitution, the rights of assembly and free speech. And if we have a president who's indicating he's going to suppress that, in my opinion, that's a state emergency. So I think a creative interpretation of constitutional and statutory provisions would allow the governor to put the state guard uh, in state service and therefore preempt any potential federalization of the Vermont National Guard by the President of the United States. And again, I'm focused specifically on that period between November 4th, 2020 and January 20th, 2021. I think that's a very dangerous time in this country. A quick question for clarification back to um back to General Knight or, or um, someone else, just, just to be clear, when, uh, when we're talking about Army reservists, we're not talking about the Guard. Is that right? Am I, am I getting that right? We could, we get need to unmute. There we go. Uh, Mr. Chair, there are, there are a reserve of the Army and that includes the National Guard. 
So we are considered a reserve of the Army and the Air Force, as is the U.S. Army Reserve and the Air Force Reserve. The difference is our pay is derived under Title 32, and a guard status uh, reserves align under Title 10, which is where their pay derived from, and that's under the active duty office. So, and, and just to be clear for us all, Title 10 is fed the federal um, when you're when you're federalized. Yes, sir. Okay, and so, um, Rep. Uh, Senator White. I just um, because of a bill that we're doing tomorrow, I just happen to have a copy of the uh, all hazards events under which the governor can declare a state of emergency and two of them are significant event and designated special event. I, I, I don't know that that would ever happen, but um, it does seem that the governor could could do that if he or she so choose. Well, it would be he because Governor Scott is our governor right now and would be governor at the time. So just wanted to point that out. Ed, before I move over to Richard, um, so let me be clear, let me just see if I heard what you were saying um, as to your point. You were thinking, you were hoping that if necessary, that that the governor, in this specific instance of the time period that you're, you're concerned about, that the governor would, um, if there's rumblings that the, go that the president may call up the f and federalize our National Guard, that the governor would preempt that, would stop that by calling them up in order to protect Vermonters um, in a traditional way, as, as the guard has defined in their traditional way, which is to protect Vermonters, as opposed to um, waiting to be federalized uh, by, the, by the federal government in order to stop an insurrection as determined, as decided by the federal government. Am I am I ballparking that at all? Uh, well, that's generally yes. I generally agree. Uh, it isn't, except for the last part of what you said. It would not be at all my intent to have the governor call up the National Guard to state service to preempt the use, the legitimate use of the National Guard by a president, because there was indeed um, a, a legitimate insurrection going on. Um, I'm relating to the specific comments which are coming from the present president of the United States. He's being uh, very specific in what he is saying and he's ratcheting it up. And so my suggestion a few minutes ago was, as I understand the case law, and I, I have to look up the case, but I'm pretty sure there is case law that says if, if a National Guard has already been called out for state service, that, that same guard cannot be called out for federal service. They can't be in two places at once. So if the guard is activated by a governor, uh, that's the priority. And until that service is complete, the commander in chief on the federal level does not have access to that National Guard unit. Now, I believe I'm correct in saying that. I don't have the case law in front of me, but there, was, there were cases that went into the federal court system in the 1980s. Some of you may recall in the 1980s, National Guard units were being sent by the then president to Central America and governors of Massachusetts. And I believe Governor Coonan at one point attempted to prevent the use of the National Guard for those purposes. And in those cases, I believe there was dicta that talked about if guard units are activated for state service, they cannot likewise be used for federal service. So that's a long-winded response. Sorry to take so long. Okay. Um all right, with that, um, I'd like to pass the microphone to Richard Saplinski. And Richard, if you could just you know, identify yourself and tell us who you're affiliated with and what your interest is in this particular, um, at hopefully theoretical circumstance, um, uh, that would be well, more than welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Chairman Stevens, uh, and for the opportunity to uh, talk to you uh, hopefully, uh, it won't come to what we're talking about here. And uh, <clears throat> let me tell you, I am uh, president of the Vermont uh, chapter of Veterans for Peace. 
which is a national organization. We have chapters in most states and some in other countries actually. <clears throat> and I talk to the national office regularly and, and tell them what we're doing here. And basically we're trying to uh, foster peace, work for peace rather than uh, go to war. Um, just as a, as a statement, the US has been at war for what, uh, <clears throat> most of the time since uh, we were founded as a nation, I think except for 20 years. And we have some very long wars going on now. Uh, <clears throat> so um, with that as an introduction, um, uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, I'm sorry I didn't um, file any testimony. Uh, I wasn't aware that we had to file testimony, but I think you got a copy uh, Mr. Chairman of my letter that I sent to my uh, senators and representatives in the legislature expressing the concern uh, <clears throat> about uh, what is happening um, around the country and what might happen here. Uh, <clears throat> it's pretty clear from the conversations I have and recent ones I've had with many of the peace and justice groups where I called a meeting together and we had about 20 people uh, talking about uh, their concerns, uh, not only with, uh, mostly with the racial considerations uh, <clears throat> in the state and um, the least protected people here. But there is a lot of anxiety um, and concern and um, hopefully, um, th and there's division. I mean, and what we have to do um, is something prior to when it comes, before it comes to a riot or, in insurrection. There are ways to, I think, avoid this kind of thing. And um, I thank the guard for filling us in on uh, what they are there for. But one of the things they didn't mention is that, which is what we need to do is protect our free speech and rallies and protests are speech. And we have to be sure that that speech is protected. And uh, <clears throat> One way to protect that is, is to work ahead of time with uh, protesters. And I may be on the street uh, protesting or rallying to make my voice heard. And I want to make sure that I'm in tune with the law enforcement officers, with the National Guard, that we've done everything to make sure that free speech is protected and that our lives are protected. And of course, that property is protected. And it could mean something that the National Guard, the police march along with us as we go along to make sure that those kinds of disruptions do not occur. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things um, um, <clears throat> that I think, I think I told in my, um, I hope you have my letter to my representatives, but uh, <clears throat> I met with uh, the new police chief in Montpelier uh, Brian Pete, and he took the place of uh, Tony Fakus, who I knew very well um, because his he was a um, classmate of my son in the Montpelier High School for all all those years. And I wanted to meet Brian Pete, make sure he knew who I was, and make sure that we could work together to avoid any kind of situations that might come up when we're protesting or rallying. And uh, we had a good conversation and I think we know each other coming from and uh, I'll be in touch with him when we're planning anything. And I think that's the kind of thing we, we ought to be doing with the National Guard, with whoever we can to make sure that um, that free speech is protected and it's not disrupted by other elements. And uh, I'm not sure what that can be, but I think there maybe is something that the legislature can do uh, in this respect. Um, I think that's probably um, all I need to say, and I'm sorry I could follow this up with, with certain things uh, uh, in more detail, but um, if there are any questions, uh, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, thank you, Richard. I, I would be happy to send the email that you shared with us um, and have it posted uh, that expressed your concerns in more detail. That would be, I'd be happy to do that. And that'll be up um, certainly by tomorrow. Um, and if there is further information you'd like to share, 
then I would be um, happy to post it under your, your comments as well. Um, any Thank questions you. for for Mr. Zaplinski? The the group that you're with, Richard, can you just um, I, I know you from being here in the valley, and 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 can you just tell me a little bit more about this group um, here in Central Vermont, anyway? That 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 you're affiliated with? Yes, it's a statewide group. Um, we are, we're a small group and where most of us are old, <clears throat> we're from the Vietnam era usually. Um, I uh, served in the US Navy um, in 64 to 69. Um, <clears throat> my brothers were in the National Guard. My uncle died in World War II. Uh, so we have a history, uh, you know, if, with knowing what the military is all about and the necessary function. Um, but our group is, you know, mainly um, trying to foster peace, work for peace. And uh, the kinds of things we do, uh, we will protest certain things that we think this country uh, shouldn't be doing. Uh, if you look um, on our website, and we do have a website, uh, you can see that we spend a lot of time uh, going uh, around getting petitions to stop the drone bombing and so on effort. Um, uh, we feel that's a, a counterproductive effort, and uh, we spend a lot of time on that, and our national organization also does. Um, <clears throat> you know, there is um, a lot of civilian casualty, uh, and I think we make more enemies than um, we make friends. Uh, one of the things uh, we were, I particularly notion, noticed was that when President Trump uh, designated the Iranian Guard as a terrorist organization, I knew immediately that something was going to be up. And on just before the end of the year or right at the beginning of the year, uh, <clears throat> General Suleimani was assassinated by this country. And what that means is if Iranians did the same thing to us, they wouldn't assassinate the chief of uh, our Joint Chiefs of Staff. That's pretty serious business. And I think that is not a good a thing that this country ought to be doing. So that's an example of the kinds of things uh, that we're concerned with. Um, uh, you, we can talk about, uh, we also, one of the main things I'm working on right now is the juncture between uh, the climate crisis and how much money is spent by the US military. I mean, we spend a, a tremendous amount is it's going up to almost a trillion dollars per year. It's about a three quarters of a trillion now. And there's some that we can't account for. <clears throat> and uh, do we need 800 foreign bases out in the country? Some of that could be used here to reduce our debt and to use it to uh, help uh, much of that, much of the things that are not now uh, taken care of. <clears throat> Uh, for supporting our citizens here. A uh, couple of examples uh, for you, Norman uh, Stevens. Great, thank you. Um, any further questions right now? I mean, I want to um, be respectful of all our time, of course. Um, so gen general, um, general Knight, I want to thank you for coming in, um, and I want to I, th I want to thank you for um, opening yourself up to this conversation and for listening, um, and for sharing where the guard stands. I think that it's clear that I mean one one. Um, I think very difficult witness or very difficult situation would have been actually to have the governor here or, um, but we, we, there's not a place to put him on the spot in this conversation because it's conjecture. And I think, um, but I do think the interplay between um, what, what our governor, no matter who that is, has in this conversation is very, very important um, because as, as I think the guard was saying is that they respond well, to you know, and they are the people of the state of Vermont. And so I'm just curious, um, you know, how that would be 
how that might work. And I don't think this is necessarily a forum today, but um, I do appreciate your, your coming in. Do you have any final comments for us um, as we head out today? Well, Mr. Chair, uh, again, I think all of us appreciate the opportunity. Certainly appreciate the dialogue um, and not necessarily on this topic, but I wanted to make sure that all the senators and representatives uh, received the legislative summary I sent out a few weeks ago. I uh, figured I've been in the job for a year and a half and it seemed to make sense that uh, we're keeping you posted on what it is that your door has been doing. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Szaplinski for his service. Uh, very much appreciated during a very challenging time in our nation's history. But thanks everybody for the opportunity and uh, look forward to uh, speaking to you again. All right, thank you. And I'll, I'll make the, the really the broad comment that I can't, I'm very grateful as a Vermonter and as an American citizen that we can actually have this conversation in a respectful way. And um, I think that's a, I think that's a right that all of us who are on the Zoom page really appreciate and work for every single day. So um, I wanna thank Ed and Richard for coming in and sharing their thoughts. Um, this is, I, I've heard from more folks um, over the last month or so on this issue on just wondering what the interplay is. And so the information that we receive today is very important for, for, for us to understand and transmit to our um, constituents when we can. And I would like to th you know, thank Ed and Richard for caring enough to, to dedicate your time um, and your, and your um, really your lives to the, you know, making sure that this balance exists and that things remain as transparent as we possibly can have them. And I'd like to thank the guard for their service. Um, it's a tough time for all of us. And, and I just appreciate that um, you were able to come forward. Thank you to Senator Polina and Collimore um, and Bray who are still here and, and uh, Senator White and Clarkson had to step off. So thank you very much for joining in on, on this conversation. And thank you committee. Um, for for uh, listening in. So with that, um, I would call this meeting, I guess, to end. Do, do we have any further comments? I'm, I'm going to offer one more time before we close up. One more, any more room? Richard? Yes, yeah, so I, I wonder if the National Guard would be open to uh, conversations with how to um, head off something like this and how to work together when it should come to that with the peace and justice groups. And there are quite a few that are very concerned about how this will go. Um, that would, I mean, we can arrange, you know, we can afford the um, connection and it'd be up to you guys to set it up and see what happens. I think, you know, their testimony today shows that they're, I think they're willing to have a dialogue um, knowing that there are other people who are telling the guard where and when to be, where they need to be. So I think there's a, um, I mean, I would hope that there would be a conversation, but perhaps we can, um, you know, we can um, mediate a conversation or at least try to see if that, that can happen. But I know from the guard members in my community um, that they really do take their location seriously and, and the fact that they're, they're at home and would, would um, go to all ends to protect their local people. Yes, thank you. And, and one other comment, uh, we could, could also do that with our local enforcement officials, uh, like I did with Brian Pete, to get to know them, know where we are, know who we are, and how we can cooperate. And I think we're at the beginning statewide of having that conversation, so. Um, thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, have a good, oh, wait a minute. Ed, you're muted, sorry. And it is true. There you go, oh, you're still muted. I just wanted to thank you, Chairman Stevens and Chair, Chairwoman White for this opportunity for us all to have this dialogue. I think once again, this is a the 1001 example of how things are unique in Vermont, where we can all come together and discuss these things in a civil way on behalf of what Martin Luther King called 
the beloved community. We're all in this together. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And again, you're welcome. And thank you for sharing.